All right, John chapter number five, and we got down through verse 19 and 20 last time, and uh, we're just going to, we were talking there in verse 20 last time about the Father loveth the Son, and we were talking about the agape and the phileo and so forth. So just kind of, we're going to move on. What we're going to do this evening is just take the, the few minutes that it's going to take to go down through verse number 30, and then next week we're going to go back and pick up some details in the section. But just to get it into your, mind, in, into your frame of reference again of what's going on here, verse 17, we'll start there. But Jesus answered them, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. Therefore, the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. Now, the Lord's been doing the, we, we're in the third miracle. He goes into the, he goes into that area, uh, the Bethesda there in the sheep market pool and everything, picks the guy out, heals him, and it's on the Sabbath. And he does it for a reason on the Sabbath, and we've looked at all of that. But now, he said, the Father and I are equal. He, he now makes a statement in verse 17 that's got him in trouble. But the trouble's what he's looking for. Because there, there's an issue here now. And, and by the way, the next miracle is in chapter 6 with the feeding of the 5,000. So again, we have miracle, then we have kind of a dialogue, a discussion happening in the next miracle. And in this discussion now, we're, we're really going, seeing here a, a, a rather long discussion about Jesus Christ being God. He is the Word that was made flesh and dwelt among us. And, and this issue here now it, that's going to happen is basically, he says, the Father worketh hitherto and I work. We're, we're partners in the work and... <clears throat> I'm equal with him, and he's, he's making a claim, I should say, that we're, the Father and I are equal. Now, it's an interesting thing in verse 18 that the Jews got what he said. They didn't like it. They labeled it blaspheme, and they're going to kill him for it. So it isn't that they didn't understand what he said. They got what he said. And by the way, there's going to be references now as we go down through this section where they know what he's talking about. There is no ambiguity when he makes some of these claims and so forth. They know it. They understand it. They're going to then nail him for it. The thing is, is they just don't believe that he is the Son of God. You know, they, <laughs> It isn't that they don't know this, the Old Testament because they're well-schooled in it. Paul, Saul of Tarsus, he sat at the feet of Gamaliel. Gamaliel was a, one of the leading lawyers of the day you know, according to the history books, but also according to Scripture. Gamaliel is the one that came in and stopped them from killing Peter and the guys based upon the miracle they did. He said, look, <laughs> they did this. You can't say God didn't use them to do this. Now, we can say some other things about using the name of Jesus, but you better leave these guys alone because if, God, if we kill them and God did it, then we're in deeper trouble than what you think. So when he begins here, verse 19, then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. Now we're going to see a case, the whole case here, where Jesus Christ is now going to claim equality with the Father, and when he does that, he's going to make his own claims, starting in 19 to 30, basically. Then in 31 and following to the end of the chapter, there's going to be some witnesses that the, that the Lord is going to call on. If you look at verse 31, If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another that beareth witness of me. And I know that the witness which he witness, witnesseth of me is true. And that witness is the Father. And he's going to bring, the Lord is going to bring the witness of John the Baptist, who was sent by the Father, and what John the Baptist then says about him, about Christ. Then he's going to go and say, See, now the Father also has sent me some works to do, and you're seeing the works. 
And then he says, now the Father gave the Word, the Scripture, and here's what the Scripture says. So not only is he going to make some claims about himself, but then he's going to call in some witnesses that are going to verify his claims to be accurate. And in verse 19, he starts, and we spent time here the last couple weeks in verse 19 and 20. And again, the issue here is when he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, likewise, like, uh, there also doeth the Son likewise. When he says that, he's not saying he doesn't have the ability to do it. He's saying, rather, what I'm doing here is I've decided to, I've chose to follow the will of the Father. Now, what the Lord is doing here is He's demonstrating the, how God designed the Lord. You have to think about this a little bit, I guess. This, Jesus Christ is the Godhead. He's the manifestation of the Godhead bodily, Colossians says. Okay? So what you're seeing is you're seeing the Son of God, the Godhead, in flesh, in, human, in humanity. He, he, he's going uh, to be that manifestation of the glory of the incarnate Son. He, here, he is, here is what God, the Godhead, if you will, the Trinity, the three, they're, now they're manifest in flesh. So he's 100% human, uh, humanity, he's 100% deity. He, he's both. But what Christ is demonstrating here, in a minute we're going to see some works and some other stuff that he's going to be doing, is he's demonstrating in his humanity how God designed his life, God's life, to live out in humanity. How he had originally designed for Adam and Eve to live before the, sin, before the fall. When you think about Adam and Eve before the fall, they were made in His image. And you go study out His image, and it's light. And when they eat of the fruit, their light goes out. They don't die. There's a spiritual death. But So when you think about that issue of when Christ is sitting here and He says, Hey, look, I'm doing what the Father did here, verse 30. I can of my own self do nothing, as I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. See, he, he goes, hey, I'm here to do the will of the Father. The Father's the one that sent me. And when he, and by the way, always read 30, verse 30 with verse 19. They, they help each other, they help understand what's going on. I'm here to do the will of the Father. I'm not here to do my will. He, had the, he has his own will. He's his own person of the Godhead. But the Godhead lives for one another. They don't live for themselves. So even if the son had his own will to, you know, I'm not going to do that, I'm going to do this, he would have never done it because what does it do? It detracts from another member of the Godhead. And you have to remember that as we come down through some of that and we've been looking at it. And then verse 20, For the Father loveth the Son... And showeth him all things that himself doeth, and he will show him greater works than these that ye may marvel. And, and again, we, we looked at that issue about the agape and the phileo, and here it's phileo. It isn't agape love, it's phileo love. You know, so we, we, we you know, look down through that, and, and really what you're seeing in verse 20 is, 20 is the intimacy. The intimate relationship that the three, that the Godhead have with each other. And, and we usually correlate out that word intimacy to marriage. And it's into me see. And really, that, that is literally to have someone who can literally see into you. And know you and, and understand you. And really what the Lord is doing here, in, in Amos it says, can two walk to... Two can't walk together unless they agree. That's the RJ uh, paraphrase, okay? What he's saying here is, me, my father and I, we do agree. And we do walk together. And there's a oneness here. 
So as we begin to start now in verse 21, that oneness is, is showing up here as the Lord now is going to make some declarations, and some claims that He Himself had. Verse 21, For as the Father raises up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom He will. Now, notice, for as the Father, so the Son. So you have that comparison of as and so. And, and, and that's a great Bible study tool that's all through Scripture. Uh, as this is the case, so then are you. As who, what happened over here, so happens over here. And, and that's that great comparison, like and as is another one. And, and what, the fa- what the Father can do, the Son can do as well. Verse 21, as the Father raises up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. That's interesting, whom he will. The, the Son has the capacity to give life. Who can, who, who's the only person that can do that? God. Only God can give life. There's an equality here with the Father. And He's not any bigger than the Father. He's not any less than the Father. But what has the Father done? The Father has given Him the capacity to give life to whosoever He will. Verse 22, For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. By the way, in verse 21 there, the issue of quickeneth, uh, give life, you know, make alive. That is an issue here in 21 of the thing in chapter 3 with Nicodemus and being born again. So this is we're, what we're seeing in 21 and what we're going to see here in a little bit again as we go down is the issue of spiritual resurrection. Uh, that this is in verse 21 is not physical resurrection. This is a spiritual issue because Israel has to have their spiritual issue fixed first. Then we'll figure then we're resurrected in, the, then they are re, we <laughs> then they are resurrected into the kingdom. So first we we got to fix the spirit, and again, that's that born again issue in chapter three, and the issue of the new covenant. Then in verse twenty two, for the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. Now, do you think the Father has the right to judge everybody? Sure, he does. That's his right. It's his plan that man's broken up. It's his plan that sin entered into and messed up. Yet, what did he do in verse twenty two? He gave it over to the Son. He, he, he let the Son have the responsibility to carry it out. And, and you, you know, you talk about sin and how, how it comes about and the thinking process. And, and yeah, you know, I, I could sin against you guys. But really, sin is ultimately against who? God. That's ultimately where it is. And the judgment for it belongs to the Son. Now, you'll notice in verse 23, the first word is that. Here's the reason that he gives the judgment to the Son. That all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father, which hath sent him. Sent him. The reason I'm giving the judgment issue to the Son is so that honor would be brought to both. The Father, He set the structure up so that the Son would be receiving the same honor as the Father. And the Father then would be honoring who? The Son, and, the, and then the Spirit is involved. The, Father, the, the, the Lord later, He's going to say, when I'm gone, then another comforter will come. And here comes the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's going to be involved. And then the Father, later on, He'll say, the Father sent the comforter. But the Son said, you know, so you got this, this wonderful triangle and everybody's living for everybody else. They're equal in honor and esteem and value. And again, that's how the Godhead works here. 
when he set the Son up to be the judge, he did it so that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. In other words, they're equal. Come over to Colossians 1, just real quick. Paul uses a term in Colossians 1 that's, that, that is, is this issue. And, and really, when you talk about the Godhead, they live for each other. They never live for themselves. And by the way, the only way you can do that is to have three. You can't do it on two. You got to have that third person involved in the mix. Because I can honor and then be honor back, but now I got to go and honor there, you know, so you got to have the three. Colossians 1, verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. Who's going to have the preeminence? The Son. But how, why does he have the preeminence? Because the will of the Father, Ephesians 1 verse 9 and 10, said what? that, hey, out there in the dispensation of the fullness of times, we're going to gather everything back, whether it's on the earth or the heavenly program or the earthly program. We're going to put it all back under his headship. Why? Because my goal, my pleasure, the Father says, is for the, all the fullness to dwell right there in him. Because when it dwells there, and then you honor him, you're honoring me, and you're honoring the Spirit. So in John 5, when he says, hey, I got... The Father has, the Lord is speaking here, obviously. The, the, I've got every right to judge, but I'm going to give the judgment issue to my son so that he will receive the honor. And you'll honor him just as you honor me. It's interesting when you, and, and by the way, in Israel's terminology, it is always they go back to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They always go back to the fathers, don't they, in their conversation. So there is an honor given directly back up to the Father, God the Father. He says, that honor that you're doing that to me now is going to come here to my son because I just made him the judge, co-equal. We're equal. I'm not higher than him. He's not higher than me. John 5, verse 23 that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father, which hath sent him. The issue of preeminence. The Father wants the Son to be honored. I, I love that thing back in Exodus, the Lord's in the bush, and he's talking to the burning bush. He's talking to Moses. A little later he tells Moses, look, they've known me as God Almighty. Now they need to know me as Jehovah. See, there's a shift happening. And in that shift to take place, that's what we're dealing with here. Because who's, gonna, who's, who's ultimately the one that's going to bring in the new covenant with them? It's going to be the Son. And He's the one that's going to sit and judge and rule and reign. Verse 24, verily, verily, by the way, there's that verily, verily again. I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Jesus says, I'm saying this, but it's really the one that sent me that's saying this. But notice what the, what the Father He's already said up back up there in verse 21 that he raises up the dead and quickeneth them, and so the Son quickeneth. So we've already had this passing of the issue of spiritual life. Verse 24, he has the capacity to impute spiritual life now so that they can pass from death unto life. But how does that happen? Notice verse 24 carefully. How, does the, how do they pass from death to life? I say unto you, he that what? Heareth my word. And, what? Believeth on him. See, it's a hear the word and believe the word. Then what happens to them? Spiritual life comes upon them. See, we were talking 
this last couple of Saturdays ago in the men's fellowship about faith. It's always been faith alone. And throughout all, and when we went down through Romans, and I, I just I showed the guys every place that Paul talks about the issue of justification unto eternal life. It, he's quoting Old Testament passages that produce faith alone. So it's always faith and that and faith alone, even in Israel's program. Here, look over at chapter 6 of John. And look at verse 63. Here's the verse. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Chapter 17 and verse 17, he says, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. So he he's... And back in John 5, he, he moves through. He goes, hey, look, guys, the Father has sent me. I, me and the Father, we're working together. <laughs> we're, we're on the same page. I've got the, I, I understand what he's doing. I'm working with him, and I delight to do his will. I got, we got godliness on display, big time. And he says, and because of that, I'm now making some claims that the Father is back is, is, is okay with because he's the one that's telling me to make these claims. And first, here's a claim here that spiritual life is coming from me. Just as he did with the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. He comes over and he says, look, I've got water that if you drink of, you'll never thirst again. Now, he's not talking about the water down in the well. He's talking about the Spirit and the new covenant and all of that. And, and, he's, and he's the one bringing And she says, well, yeah, we know the Messiah will do that. And he says, I am he. I'm the guy. I'm the one. Well, he's driving that home here once again, but he's doing it in a manner that he says, you know what? You guys are worshiping the Father. I'm, I'm on the equal footing with him. And because I'm on equal footing, now I can make these claims because when he looked at that impotent man, you remember back there, he says, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk, verse 8, verse 9, and immediately the man was made whole. Then he, when they come down and they ask him, you know, hey, who did this to you? And he doesn't know. Jesus goes there and finds him in verse 14, and he says, Behold, thou art made whole. So there's still, he's still what? He's still whole. He had life given back to him, regenerated him. But who did that? Well, the grace of God did it. The Son did it. And that's what he's driving home here. And, and, and again, these guys know what he's saying. They, they're, they're, they're upset with him because they, <laughs> they want to be upset with him because what did he just say? I'm, I'm God. I'm equal with God. And that's blaspheme in, in, this, in, in the issue of uh, the Jews' religion. If you come... Well, let me see here. Look, look over at chapter 12 with me, just for a minute. This, this issue about hearing and believing. Believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death to life. John 12, look at verse 47. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last days. That judgment, by the way, that's Revelation 20. It's a great white throne judgment. Verse 49, For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. So when he says, hey, when you hear the words that I speak, you heareth my word, whose word is that? It's the Father's word. You believe him, 
You believe him that sent me, so you're believing the word of the Father. Remember when the Lord tells him, says, look, if you'd have believed Moses, you'd have believed me, because Moses wrote about me. So that's the idea here. But oh, by the way, if you don't believe that, it's to condemnation. The condemnation is going to be there in verse 48 about the issue of judging him in the last day, and that's the great white throne judgment out there. So when you come back to chapter 5, verse 24 is a loaded verse. <laughs> Okay, and there's a lot going on in there. Verse 25, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Now, that, there, that's some... That's a great statement right there. And, and really, there's, you almost don't want to say any more than just let it sit there. Okay, But notice, he says there in verse 25, the hour is coming and now is. We've seen that terminology already. Come back to chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 21. He, here. Verse 21, Jesus saith unto her, talking to the woman there at the well, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. Now, what he's talking about there is over in the kingdom. He's talking about the future. In the future, and over there in the kingdom, there's going to be one king and one place to worship. It's going to be in Jerusalem. That's the way it is. Verse 23, but the hour cometh and now is. When true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. But the hour cometh and what? Now is. The issue of the kingdom is coming, but that issue of the physical, earthly, Davidic, literal, visible kingdom Right now, the spiritual reality is sitting right in front of you. That's what he's saying. And the spiritual reality that's going to be manifested over there in the future kingdom, chapter 5, it's right here in front of you. Chapter 4, it's right here in front of you. Luke 16, uh, verse 16, I believe it is, where he talks about uh, the prophets, the law and the prophets were until John, then cometh the preaching of the kingdom, and every man presseth into that. I, 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 for some reason, it's not clear in my head. Is it 16, 16? Six, yeah, the law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presseth into it. What's the kingdom of God about? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And then what's going to happen? All these physical things that he listed in previous, that's Matt, over there in Matthew, are going to come to pass. So in, in, in John 5, when he says, hey, the hour is coming and now is, the, spirit, the power that is needed to become the sons of God, the power that's needed here, to spiritually we're talking about, to get over there, it's here right now. So really, when he talks about the hour cometh and now is, that's really a statement about the new covenant and the life that it will impart to them, the life that will be given to them so that they can be the power to be the nation that he always desi he had designed them to be. But you'll notice in five, John, back in John 5 in here, when the dead shall hear the voice of God and they that hear shall live. Now, this death here is spiritual death. It isn't physical death. They do what? They hear the, vo they hear the word, they believe the word, and what do they end up with? Everla e eternal life. Same thing here. When the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. Spirit, he has the authority, because he's the Son of Man, to give to them that hear the word and believe the word the issue of the spiritual life to those who right then and there. 
Now verse 26, the first word is for. The explanation. For as the Father hath life, where? In himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. So this eternal life is an inherent thing. It, it, it's where it resides. The Father has appointed the Son to be the one who's going to go out there and give eternal life to, and spiritual life to. Give them the power to become the sons of God. And He's the one that holds, He's the one that can then go and apply it. Now, the issue is they're going to do what? What's the, the standard here? They're going to hear the Word and believe the Word. Come over to chapter 6 again of John. In just 66, just see a, a couple passages, or a couple verses down from 63. 666. For what time, for that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. They're leaving him, they're rejecting him. I think it's interesting. Sometimes people have an odd view of how many people were really following the Lord. In the end, it only is the little flock. They, they drift away. And it's not a, really until you read in Acts where it's multitudes and great multitudes. And, and I know the multitudes are going to get together here, and he's going to feed 5,000, and I understand that. But what do they do in verse 66? They've, they've just got fed. You know what they say? Hey, we're going to make you king. You fed us. He goes, "Uh uh-uh. You're looking at the wrong thing. You're looking at the activity of being fed. And no, you're missing it. And off I go. Verse 67, Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? Boy, that is such a question. What a question. You know what that indicates? That they could do what? Go away. They could walk away. Do you see that? Man, that, that, that is humbling to understand. And, you know, that if it can happen to these guys in the presence of the Lord, guess what? It can happen to you and I. In Ephesians 4, starting in verse 17, it's real clear it can happen to you and I. Second Timothy is full of the fact that it can happen to you and I. Now watch Simon in verse Simon Peter in verse 68. Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? He find, Peter got a good answer here. <laughs> Thou hast the words of what? Eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Boy, that's real clear, isn't it? What did the twelve understand? By the way, he then goes on and says, I got a devil amongst you, and that's Judas Iscariot, you know. But what did did those guys understand? Here they see people leaving the Lord, leaving. And the Lord says, are you going to leave me too? And what did Peter say? There's no other place to go. Where else would we go? Uh, You're the one that has everything we need. The only place to go is Christ. Where else would you go? So up to verse 27, go back to John 5. I mean, when he says this in John 5, hey, for he's given the life and the life is in Christ. To this point, the Lord has stood and says, I have the authority from the Father to impart life to them that believe. And I can give that life that's then going to regenerate you. That's what verse 25, the dead shall hear the voice, and they that hear shall live. That's regeneration. We're going to regenerate you up. Verse 27, first word is an and, isn't it? So we're going to continue the thought here. And hath given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. So not only can He give eternal life and regenerate them, but He's also going to do what? Have the judgment and be the judge. And He's going to execute judgment. 
And the reason that he's able to execute judgment is because he's what? The son of man. Now, when you, that issue about being the son of man, come over to chapter 15 of John. John 15. <clears throat> John 15. We'll start in verse 18 to, so that we can understand the, what's going on here. John 15, 18. If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my sayings, they will keep yours also. That's an interesting thing there, isn't it? <laughs> Just because you think the world don't like you, man, they hated me first. And that's even true today. You know, you talk to people. I was talking to a lady through Facebook, and she does not like right division. Man, flat out just boom. Well, and you know, she called me every name in the book. But the issue isn't that. The issue is, and I told her, I said, you're not arguing with me. You're arguing with the Word of God. That's what you're arguing with, you know. And well, she doesn't believe the word. So the argument is not had with Rick, even though Rick's the, the one on the page. The, the argument is with the word of God. And, you know, what she was saying was just mixing. It's a name it and claim it type of comments. You know, and okay, well, that's not accurate. <laughs> and I called her on it. And she was, didn't appreciate being called on it. And that's okay because she was leading astray some folks that were trying to figure some things out. But anyway, they hate that. that's a great thing there. Now watch verse 21. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. So now notice you got three peoples involved here. You've got the Father. He's the one that sent me. You've got the Son, and then you've got the disciples. The, the guy, the, the apostles specifically here. And he says, look, the reason they hate you is because they hated me. And the reason they hate you and me is because they don't know the guy, the father that sent me. They think they're doing what? The father's, look at verse 21. They think they're doing, but all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake. They think they're doing the, God's bidding, but they don't, they're, they're clueless. In Seattle. <laughs> They're clueless here. Verse 22, if I had not come and spoken unto them, they had, they had not had sin, but now they have no cloak for their sin. He that hateth me hateth my father also. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin, but now have they both seen and hated both me and my father. But this cometh to pass, that the word might be fulfilled, that it is written in their law, they hated me without a cause. Now, that's a great passage. We're going to have fun when we come down through, some, through that. But see, the issue is, is he came as the Son of Man. And what did he do? I came, verse 24 there, and I did the works which none other man did. You know what he did? He came and kept the law perfect. Nobody ever else could do that. I came and I did what the Mosaic law required of you guys to do. I did it perfectly. Now you, they don't have any cloak for their sin. They have no place to hide. You know what you do with the cloak? You hide things. This morning I get on the bus and it's raining. And it's not a little sprinkle, it's raining. So I pull the poncho out and I put the poncho on. Why? Because I don't want to be wet. I mean, I know about knee down I get wet, but I don't want to be wet up here because of the, you know, the air conditioning and the fans and all that stuff has got to run. I don't want to be wet. So what do I do? I hide in there, don't I? I'm like sitting around there going, yeah, it looks good. <laughs> you know, if it falls off, it just does. You know, <laughs> we'll just keep going. <laughs> you know? But see, the thing is, is Jesus says, look, guys. I came and I did perfectly 
what the law required, and I demonstrated that there is now no excuse for humans to fail. There isn't. I did it. I did it in my humanity. He was tempted in all points common to man. Everybody goes, well, he didn't have the internet. Baloney, he was tempted in the three areas. You know the three areas he was tempted in? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. You know why there's only those three areas? I know people come up with, I read a guy one time years ago. He had 15,000 areas that you could be tempted in sin. The Bible says there's only three. You know why there's only three? Body, soul, and spirit. Spirit, soul, and body. The lust of the flesh, there's your body. The lust of the eyes, there's your soul. The, the pride of life, there's your spirit. The pride of life is to know stuff. I have a lot of knowledge. The eye into the soul looks down into the heart. There they are. Man, when you realize, okay, you know what he says? Hey, when you guys stumbled there, I, did, I was in the same position and I didn't stumble. You stumbled, I didn't stumble. What's the problem? What's the problem? Well, they have to go there. They have to understand that they're sinners, and what do they need? They need Christ. They can't excuse themselves away from it. They go right there. By the way, in Matthew 4 and in Luke 4, when, the, when Satan tempts the Lord, those three areas are where he tempts him. When Satan goes to Eve in Genesis 3, those three areas got her. It's like, whoa. So if, you know, here I am looking at this going, okay, now how do I, you know, I don't need 15,000 ways. I just need to get some answers to those three areas, <laughs> you know. That's why Paul will say Galatians, you know, the brain's just not working. Galatians 5, verse 24, And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. That's a great verse. Hey, I got Romans 6. I've got these verses that come in and begin to tell me how to deal with what? Those three areas. Because that's where they fall. So back in 15, John 15 here, Jesus, and by the way, just so you guys know and the people online will know and whoever watches the video, in the you, the real you study, we're going to look at all of that. Because we're going to be answering, I'm going to try and answer some different little topics of areas of struggle that we kind of run into. So you, you'll be seeing an email so that I can, I kind of get some ideas because my issues are not the same as your issues. And if, no names will be mentioned or anything, Melanie. Uh, or, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, Bruce, Susie. Uh, uh, let's see, who else is in here? Jerry, Rachel, uh, James. My friend has this issue. Well, actually, you know, usually when you hear somebody say, my friend has, it's, they're, they're talking about themselves, you know, usually. But see, the issue, the issue is, when the Lord showed up, he says, look, guys, I did it all, I did, and I did it perfectly. And by the way, look, look, look at how, I, I lost it, there it is, 15. Look at how he says it. They had not sinned, verse 24, if I had not done among them, if I hadn't come along and did the works perfectly, you know what they could have done? Then man could have blamed somebody else. See? The biggest thing since Adam and Eve has been personal accountability and responsibility. And the Lord says, listen, if I hadn't come and done this stuff perfectly... By the way, no one can do what he did. And because he did do that as the Son of Man, he successfully did the will of the Father. 15.24, they had not had sin. I'm back up in verse 22 there. But now they have no cloak for their sin. They have no place that you can go and hide. Because now the Lord can say what? Been there, done that, and I had success. You're there. You've, why did you fail? What's the issue here? What's going on? 
Well, again, the issue is to drive them to say what? <laughs> I'm a sinner and I can't do it. And I need help doing it. And I need help and I need you to help me, Lord. <laughs> okay? And again, that's where the law was driving them to. And the Lord, come back to chapter 5, he just says, hey, guys, I did it. So because he came and he did all of that as the Son of Man, what did the Father do? The Father says, you're the judge. <laughs> you be the judge then. Why? Because what can the judge say? Hey, have you ever been in front of a traffic court judge? And the judge say, huh, never? Oh, I have. <laughs> I have. <laughs> Turned 16, and in two weeks, three tickets. I was, I've been there. I know. But you know what, though? The judge sits there and he says, Son, I've been where you're at. Isn't that a little bit more comforting to know somebody understands, you know, where, where, that you're standing there shivering inside and shaking, you know? He can do that. Now as man well, is going to come and he's going to judge man there, verse 27, and has given him authority to execute judgment also, what can he say when they say, yeah, but wait a minute, Lord, you just don't know her. That woman you gave me. You know, Adam did that. First he blamed Eve, then he blamed God for giving him Eve. <laughs> Basically, right? Okay. But see, the thing is, is God says, no, 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 no. I've been where you're at. And I had success at it. He understands the law. He, understood, he understands where they're at. And you know what he's going to do? He's going to judge justly. Look at verse 30. I can of my own self do nothing as I hear. I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. His, his justice is what? Just. It's, it's not a... Outward appearance thing, it's a what? It's an evidence thing. Here's the evidence. I've been there. I've done that. I've, I've looked at that. I, I've, I, I was successful at it. The Father made me the judge. You're missing the point. And now we need to make sure you, you're, not no long, you're no longer missing the point. So you need to hear my words, and you need to believe who I am. And guess what will happen? You won't miss the point. Now, all of this, by the way, are declarations of, by Jesus Christ about why he's equal with God because who just made him equal with him? The Father did. Look at what the Father has given me. So he says, verse 28, marvel not at this. <laughs> it's no big deal. <laughs> you know, come on now. For the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth they that have done good under the resurrection of life and they that have done evil under the resurrection of damnation. I can of my own self do nothing. In the context of being the judge, he does what? Can't do anything of himself. Who's he, what's he following? The will of the Father. I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which, have, which hath sent me. Now, time's up, so we'll have to come back into 28 and 29 next time because there are some things there about the resurrections and stuff, okay? Because a couple points, we've got five minutes, a couple points here. You see in verse 25 how he says, The hour is come. And now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. And, and I, I told you that's spiritual death, and he's imparting to them the regeneration, the spiritual life of the new covenant. Verse 28, they're in the grave, so what kind of death would that be? There's the physical death. Okay, you see that? Now, what happens is, is Calvin comes along, a Calvinist will come along and say, well, the lost can't hear the gospel because they are spiritually dead. So God has to give them, he has to regenerate them, give them life, so then they can then believe. But is that what verse 25 said? Verse 25 says completely the opposite of that. When the dead shall, what? Hear the voice. Spiritually dead people hear what? Hear the voice. 
And what happens to them? They hear his word, and then they're going to live, aren't they? And that they shall, and they that hear shall live. So life, you got life coming after their hear, the hearing. The, they hear the what, by the way? The life-giving message of the kingdom and Christ and so forth. Now in verse 28, you've got the physical dead, and what do they do? They hear his voice too, don't they? <laughs> so the, uh, the Calvinist idea for people, in order for people to get saved, which is really to be one of the elect, who you really were all the time one of the elect, you just didn't know it, so God had to regenerate you, make you alive, so then you would understand and receive the message and then have eternal life. And oh, by the way, if you don't carry it out, then all this was just a smokescreen anyway because you didn't persevere to the end and you're, you're lost anyway the moment you slip up and you don't do what we're telling you to do, okay? And if you live underneath that, you're living underneath a tyranny that you'll never have joy and peace in. But notice what Scripture says. The spiritually dead, they hear the voice, they believe, they live. The physically dead, they hear the voice, and then they are resurrected. Okay? Now, if you'll notice in verse 29, the second point is that there are two resurrections listed. The resurrection of life and the resurrection of damnation. Now, what is usually said is the first resurrection is there in, Ver in Revelation 20. Then the second revelation to damnation is the great white throne judgment. There's a thousand years in between those two resurrections. Okay, So you have a doctrine that crept, creeps up called general resurrection and general judgment. <laughs> and you just scratch your head even some more. Because the generals don't want to have anything in between the two. They want them to you know, happen right away. And they use these verses. Come over with me real quick to 1 Corinthians 15. The first resurrection is re resurrection to life, and the second one is a resurrection to damnation. However, there are parts to both of it, to both resurrections. And we're going to look at this in much detail. I'm just trying to get you to notice something, something to keep you preoccupied during the week. I, I was talking to a couple Tuesday night, and... Uh, they, they're fighting, they're arguing, so I got them reading, and uh, I mean, they're arguing and fighting on the phone. Well, you know, I'm like, okay, hello, I am still here. <laughs> so I said, why don't we turn over, and I had them read Romans 5, the first 12 verses, okay? And they read it, and I go, did you notice something? <laughs> and they're like, no, what? I go, you guys haven't fought for the 10 minutes it took you to read the verses, <laughs> So maybe we ought to preoccupy your minds here a little bit and quit fighting and read something. But anyway, 1 Corinthians 15, look at verse 22, if you will. For as, it, as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Now watch verse 23. But every man in his own, what? Order. Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are at Christ at His coming. You see, there's an order to the resurrections. And you need to understand that as us today as members of the body of Christ, because if you just think that the first resurrection and the second are over there in Revelation 20, then you can quickly begin to go, well, okay, well, where are we at? And one of the things that the revelation given to Paul does is it fills in some blanks about what, is the, what, what this order in the resurrection is. And we'll look at that next time and so forth. The point in the passage isn't all of this extra, you know, two resurrections and all that. The point in the passage is that the Lord Jesus Christ is demonstrating Himself to be equal with the Lord, with the Father. And that the Father is the one that did this. And the Father gave him the rights and the positions, the rights of regeneration to give eternal life to whom he will, 
the rights of judgment, the rights of resurrection, was given to the Son by the Father, not the Son taking them and doing it on His own. And that's really the point in John 5. And, and again, the whole of John is to demonstrate that the Lord is the Son of God, the Son of the living God. Okay? All right, so we'll pick up and look at those resurrections next time. It'll be a little special on, on a side, and then we'll continue down because now in 31 and following, we get into the issues of the witnesses that are going to come, that are there, that are being brought forward so that they can then demonstrate that, yes, the statements are true, and yes, here's the, the accounts and the witness, okay? All right, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the evening, Lord. We thank you for the look into the passage and to see the wonderful rights and positions that the Father has given to you in, the, in Israel's program. And as you walk and do your earthly ministry, you do it because of the will and the word of the Father. And we'll give you the praise and the glory for that. In your name we pray. Amen.